Shalom friends, grace and peace be unto you. Welcome back. Welcome back to my channel. It is good that we can meet again on this day that the Lord has given us a, a special day. He has given us where we learn to rest in him. We learn to disconnect ourselves from the busyness of life and, and, and just come to rest in his presence, to rest in his grace. You know, the psalmist David says, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. Today is an awesome day. It's a great day to rejoice, to rejoice in the God of our salvation, to rejoice in the God of our rock, our fortress, to rejoice in the one who gives life. And as I speak of rest, every one of us needs rest. We we work throughout the week and we become overwhelmed, we become tired by the, the strenuous activities of life. And so the Lord has set aside a day and he says, rest, rest yourself, rest and, and you know, from the cares of life, from the labor of life and come and connect with me, come and meet with me. And so while this happened on a weekly basis, we anticipate the time to come when we will be with him, we will be resting with him in eternity forever. What an amazing time that is going to be. What a great time of engathering that is going to be when we rest together with our Savior forever. I pray that each of us, I mean, each of us, each of you who come to listen to these teachings, that you are preparing your hearts, you're preparing your soul for that time to come. And I pray too that today's session will help to empower your life. Yeah, that today's session is going to, you know, open up your eyes a little more and give you a better understanding as we make that preparation for that time of rest. Um, we're going to, we're going to be going or looking at a statement that Jesus made in St. John chapter 3, 14. St. John chapter 3, 14 through 15, he says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who trusted in him may have eternal life. And in the same vein, in St. John chapter 3, 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so we're going to be looking at the connection and we're going to see how that plays out in our own life as we come into this personal walk and into this personal relationship with him. And so in the text in St. John chapter 3, uh, Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus. And this is quite a familiar text. Right? It says that it was by night he went um, to Jesus. He went by night because a person of his status, you know, he didn't want to be seen with um, Yeshua in public view. And they are having this conversation about being born again. And Yeshua said to him, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, of course, he was confused because as a leader in Israel who held one of the highest office and one who went through every process available in Judaism as it relates to being born again, he was confused. So in Judaism, there are four processes to the term born again. And he would have been qualified for these four um, stages. Um, the first one, it says, when a Jewish boy be, gets to age 13, right, he is circumcised, he is called to bar mitzvah, and he is said to be born again. And uh, the, second, uh, the second one is by marriage. So when a Jewish man marries, he was said to be born again. And as a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious court, he had to be married. So that was um, Nicodemus. When he was ordained as a rabbi and the final stage was to be the head of a rabbinical school, that too was said that he was born again, right? And that was why Jesus would have said to him, 
that he held the office of a teacher in Israel, which meant he was already head of a rabbinical school. So in effect, he would have gone through all the processes, right? So he was called to bar mitzvah, he was married, he was a teacher, and he was also head of a school. So he would have satisfied the processes. Right? But he was still confused as he didn't understand that born again really means, and this now gives Yeshua the opportunity to explain some spiritual truth to this already born again teacher. He needs to be spiritually born again. right? And so he says, unless a person is born from the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God while we would have gone through the immersion that equates ritual cleansing of the body. It is the spirit that enables people, the spirit of God that enables people to turn from sin and to live holy lives to the glory of God. And so Yeshua even went further and he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up so that everyone who trusted in him may have eternal life so right off the bat it is telling us that to enter into the kingdom of god to experience eternal life it happens in a spiritual way it is nothing that is done physically and so this was symbolic right this was a picture of yeshua ex explained to nicodemus of things to come but first we see how the story is it's a foreshadowing of what jesus will accomplish in time to come more than thousands of thousands of years later right so what was happening in israel at the time speaks to what would come in the future when moses lifted up the bronze serpent for the people to see he was providing a remedy for all who would come to look at it to look up right now yeshua is going to be lifted up right and the work that he was gonna do through i mean in his lifting up would have been greater than that of the lifting up of the bronze servant which was bronze serpent which was temporary and we know yeshua's work speaks to permanency and uh, we can all be saved from eternal death we don't have to stay into that place of torment and separation from god right but by looking up looking to the messiah the person of messiah who was lifted up in death we too can experience life and understand what born again means so in making this spiritual point as it relates to born again Yeshua make reference to the event that happened in numbers chapter 21 and i want to read from verse 4 to 8 it says they traveled, meaning the people of Israel, they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against Moses. They sp I'm sorry, they spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the de desert? There is no bread. There is no water. We detest this miserable, miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They beat the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So the people prayed for, so Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten, can look at it and live so Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake he lived so that's the context when Yeshua make reference 
of saying, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who trusted in him may have eternal life. So that's the life of Israel. The Israelites, they were now in the last year of their journey into the wilderness, through, I mean, going through the wilderness. And as always, they continue to complain, they groan, they mope, they murmur, who are going to die, and uh, all of these things. Recently, we talk about um, the fact that complaining is a sin, and we should be aware of the danger of complaining, right? Instead, we should have or exhibit the spirit of gratitude, and we are to learn <clears throat> contentment even in the hard moments of our lives. The Apostle Paul spoke much of, on that. You know, he said, in whatever situation I'm in, I learn to be content. So the problem with complaining, as we see going through scripture, as it relates to Israel, is that God is always listening. He hears our words and he weighs our hearts. When we allow ourselves to get into self-pity self and we give and we carry a critical spirit, we are already victim of the evil one, right? The thing we must remember is that the enemy is a professional slanderer. He started that in the Garden of Eden. He is referred to as the accuser of the brethren and the originator of rebellion against God, right? He was the very first one to express discontentment with the lot in life God has assigned to him. It all started with him. And so when we show ingratitude toward God and complain about what his ways, even when we don't understand it, we are speaking the language of the enemy. We are basically speaking the language of the native tongue, right? And so what it does, when we begin to, 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 to embrace these practices, we are poisoning our hearts. We are releasing poison in our hearts and actually harden our hearts, even against the word of God and the spirit of God upon our lives. So we see the children of Israel, they complain about everything. They complain about water. They complain about the manna. They complain about leadership and God heard and as a result this time around he sent a punishment of the poisonous snakes and so why did God use snakes to punish Israel right uh, uh, let me share what a commentator says Rashi a Jewish commentator says that God chose snakes for two reasons the serpent in the garden of Eden was punished for speaking words of slander against God and the God sent the serpent who was punished for speaking slander to, to punish those who were guilty of speaking slander. And the second reason was that the, the serpent had been cursed to eat dust all the days of its life. So God sent the serpent who was punished by giving a diet of dust to punish those who complain about their food. But we see the people came to Moses and they admitted that they have sinned. They said, we have, we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes away from us. So we see the solution to the problem is repentance. That's the only solution. We have sinned. They acknowledge that they have sinned. And when we acknowledge that we are sinners and we are in need of a savior, it makes the difference in our lives. So the serpent, as we see, is the devil. And we are the sinners. And if we want to be healed and delivered from the serpent, we need to repent. We need to confess our sins. We need to um, seek forgiveness. And the forgiveness comes only through Yeshua, the shed blood of Yeshua. So Moses interceded, as we read, Moses was really a man of God, you know. He was a really a man of, of a God's own heart. Do you realize that Moses did not carry grudges or bitterness or resentment 
he didn't. In as much as the people criticize and resent his leadership, they come back begging him to pray for them, right? Pray for them because Moses was really the righteous leader. And so the Lord told Moses to make the snake and to put it upon the pole. And those who were bitten, when they look up, they would be healed. So the point that, yeah, that Yeshua was making to Nicodemus is that man is not able to save himself. Man needs to look up to the creator, right? The Israelites were saved from the plague of the serpent when they gaze up, when they look up on the brass serpent that was raised. And in this, we see that the very creature, right, that injured them could also heal them. And uh, it is not the serpent, really. It was actually the sin of the people. And so in, 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 in Moses placing the pole, putting the pole, the, the, the serpent up on that pole, the people had to look up. And we need to now move this from a, a physical looking up to a spiritual looking up because we know that God is the source of our lives and we have to look up to him. The Psalmist David declares that I will lift my eyes to the hill from whence come my help. And so in looking up, the people now are getting a better understanding that they are now making a connection with their God. Right? So it wasn't just the serpent, it wasn't just the pole, but it had greater significance. Right? And so the next question is, um, did, the, did the serpent on the pole really heal the people? And some people believe it was a magical situation. And so the theme that I'm using for this is, it's not magic, right? Considering that serpents are usually associated associated with Satan or evil, was it the pole? Was it the serpent on the pole? And so the sages explain that it was faith in God and obedience that resulted in miraculous healing. It was not a magical property of the bronze serpent. This was actually a supernatural move of God and uh, this is not the first time that God is showing his power. It's not the first time. He did it back in Egypt, right? And we know the story of Israel in Egypt and all the miraculous things that God did for them. But there is also in Exodus chapter 15, verse 25, when Israel complained that, that, um, how God told Moses to put this piece of bitter stick into the water to sweeten the water because they complained that the water was bitter, right? And so the bitter stick, the piece of bitter stick sweetened the bitter water. That, that is supernatural. That is really supernatural, right? And here we are again, and it, it says that in the time of Elijah, the prophet Elisha, how he used... Um, to purify water, harmful water, in Second Kings chapter 2, that Elijah, when they went into the land, and it says the water is bad and the land is unproductive, and Elisha said, bring me a new bowl. He said, put some salt in it. So they brought it to him, and he went out into the spring, and he threw the salt into it, saying, this is what the Lord says, I have healed this water, never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained wholesome to this day, according to the word Elijah had spoken. So God has a way of performing miracles. He has a way of doing things that is just mind blowing, right? And it is these instances are referred to as miracle within a miracle, right? It's a miracle within a miracle. And so as we see the bronze serpent, the people looking up brings healing. 
in the course of time, right, the people, they lost sight of the symbolical meaning as it relates to the serpent, right, and the healing power, and they now made it an object of worship. So what were they doing? They now begin to worship the created things instead of the creator. And until today, there are still many people who are worshiping the created things rather than the creator. I mean, they are idolizing people. They are worshiping money. They are worshiping all that which is material, some to the point of their children and the people continue to do these things and their hearts are far removed from God. And so as a result of that, as a result of that incident, during the reign of King Hezekiah, he learned, he now abolished the shrines and he smashed the altars. He broke into pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until that time, the Israelites had been sacrificing to it. And it was called Nehushtan. That's the name of the bronze serpent. So you read about that in 2 Kings chapter 18. Right? So when the people of Israel lifted up their eyes towards heaven, they were actually submitting their ways and their will to their father. Right? And it was at that point that they experienced healing. It was actually at that point that they experienced healing. So, so just as uh, the Israelites needed to look up, right, by faith to God's provision for their physical um, deliverance in the wilderness, just as they had to look up for their provision for divine healing, right? Even so, Yeshua is saying to Nicodemus, you can't help yourself. You can't save yourself. You need to look to the source of life. You need to look to the life giver, right? This is not about ritual, going through ritualistic um, 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 things, but in coming to agreement and receiving the spirit of God in your life, because you need the both to work together. Even in our own time, we need to look to God. We need to look to him as the source of our lives. We need to look to him for our spiritual deliverance that comes through the shed blood of his son, the Messiah. And so in St. John chapter 3, verse 16, we read that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but would have everlasting life. And so today, the way to life eternal is to acknowledge that we are sinners. That was what Israel did. They said to Moses, we have sinned. They acknowledge their, um, their they, they acknowledge the fact that they have sinned. What did they do? They murmur and they complain. They murmur against Moses and they murmured against God. They complain against Moses and they complain <clears throat> against God. And so they had to go back to Moses to say, we have sinned. And today, that's what we need to do. There is, there is access to God's mercies through the shed blood. And this is what we remember all the time. We have no merit of our own. We stand on his merit. And that is why when we pray, we pray in his name because we have no merit on which to stand on. So for God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. The, the people of Israel, when they look up, they were healed and they were saved 
they no longer die. And today, Yeshua is already lifted up and he shed his blood, right? So that we can experience the redemption of, we can experience forgiveness and the redemption of our sins. And I want to say to you today that you don't have to die in your sins. You don't have to stay at that place, right? Where, where you are dying um, spiritually. And so right now I believe somebody may say, but I'm alive, I am, I am, I'm healthy, I'm well, the doctor's report you know declares me well this is not about a physical health people this is about your spiritual life that you need to return to god in righteousness you need to return to that place right to that place where you acknowledge that he is god the creator of the universe and without him in your life then life is vain and so you have the opportunity. There's, this is a new leash for you. This, this is a miracle. Sometimes we try to understand how it works. Hmm? But this also is a miracle within a miracle that in a moment, miraculously, your life can be transformed. Miraculously, your life can be changed. Miraculously, you are moved from point A to point B. Miraculously, your sins are forgiven. Miraculously, you don't have to look back. Right? You don't have to look back on all the things that you did because God has bring forgiveness to you. Today, I pray that you will consider this session and you will give some thoughts to it and understand that it is in looking up to God that you are able to experience eternal life. I pray that you will be blessed as you listen. And, uh, and again, I ask that you will share with your contact and that together everyone will be blessed by the word of God. I pray that this week, coming week, that you will spend some time and just focus on the word of God. For God so loved the world, he made no distinction. All people, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, doesn't matter who you are, either you, whether you are Jew or Greek or bond or free, all people now have access as a result of the blood. All people now have access by means of the work to come to walk into obedience by obeying the word of God. All of us, it's a great privilege. Let us not abuse it. Let us make the best of it. May God bless you richly until we meet again. Thanks for watching. Bye.